Okay, determining the cost effectiveness threshold. As I say, we need to be able to specify a threshold because if we're measuring uh, cost effectiveness as cost per quality gained, by itself, that number doesn't really tell us anything. That number can only tell us something uh, when we put it in the context of a cost effectiveness threshold. So for example, in Japan, would 10,000 yen per quality gained be good value? Well, almost certainly. Would 100,000? Yes. Would uh, 20 million yen per quality gained be good value? Um, probably not. Big gap between 100,000 and 20 million. Um, where should the threshold lie? And without a threshold, we just have these numbers that say the cost per quality was such and such, but it's not really um, information that we can find very helpful without some idea as to how much we are willing as an organization or perhaps even as a society to spend to get an additional health benefit. Now there's a number of source, potential sources for cost effectiveness threshold. One approach that's been suggested is to look at past decisions and ask what value is implied by past decisions. So if we look at the things that we've said yes to previously or the things we've said no to previously and we look at their cost effectiveness, their cost per quality gained, could that have an implied threshold? <clears throat> well, certainly this has been done and people have looked at a series of decisions and tried to say what cost effectiveness threshold is implied. But really, it's a rather unsatisfactory approach. It's unsatisfactory because just because in the past we made one decision or a series of decisions that implied a particular cost effectiveness threshold, that doesn't mean it's the right threshold. It doesn't mean it's the right threshold for the future. Also, if somehow in the past we've been able to be consistent, why do we even need a threshold? If, if somehow in the past, without almost thinking about it, we've been able to make the right decision, why, why do we need to formalize it now? And of course the answer is, well, we haven't in the past. We've made decisions that have implied different thresholds in the past. So that's probably not a very good source. Second um, potential approach for identifying a cost effectiveness threshold is to try and identify society's willingness to pay for additional health benefit. How much is society willing to pay? So for example, in a context such as Japan and certainly such as England, where the healthcare system is predominantly, um, the money is coming from taxation. In such a system as that, how much are taxpayers willing to pay? How much more tax would they be willing to pay in order to get additional health benefits? Now, this approach has been used. The estimates cover a really wide range. And maybe it's not surprising because um, if you're asking an individual, how much are you willing to pay in order to acquire additional health benefit. That's really quite a tough question for most individuals. They don't think of life that way. Um, particular problem we have in, um, in England, if you try and ask someone that question, is they say, I'm not willing to pay anything. I pay taxes. You provide the health care. I expect you to provide the health care because I've paid taxes. I'm not going to say I'm willing to pay so much more for a health benefit. But it's certainly a potential approach. Although, as I say, the actual values that have been generated are all over the place because it's, 
it's quite well we'll I'll go into willingness to pay estimates a little bit in the fourth lecture. <clears throat> Another approach which has really been quite popular and again particularly in low middle income countries is relating the cost effectiveness threshold to per capita gross domestic product or GDP. And for a number of years, uh, WHO, World Health Organization, were really pushing this approach. And the idea was that if an intervention had, typically in a low middle income country context, it's been cost per dally, disability adjusted life year, rather than cost per quality. But for our purposes, while they're not the same, they're the same concept. They're a general measure of health benefit. And the cost per dally that was considered to indicate cost effectiveness was when the cost per dally was less than three times GDP per capita. Less than three times GDP per capita. And that was deemed cost effective. And if the intervention was had a cost per dally of less than GDP per capita, it was deemed highly cost effective. Now, more recently, since about 2015, WHO have perhaps recanted on this and have said, oh, that's not what we really meant. Uh, they've not been very pers persuasive in their statements. Um, so I'm quite glad to say, gradually, we're reaching a situation now where people are moving away from the idea of GDP per capita. It was not a helpful concept. In most low-income countries, the range of interventions that we could identify that met those criteria, either three times GDP particularly, or even one times GDP, was really very high. But very few of these interventions subsequently got funded because of this problem I'll be saying more about. The budget is quite small and the list of interventions that appear to meet your threshold for cost effectiveness is quite high. And so uh, the many interventions were getting labelled cost effective because of this criterion of one or three times GDP per capita, but it was not meaningful or helpful for decision makers. It's not absolutely obvious why GDP per capita should be an indicator of cost effectiveness. I suppose in one very crude sense, you can see the idea that if GDP per capita is very high, it's a very wealthy country. If you're very wealthy, then you are willing to spend a bit more to get a health benefit. If GDP per capita is very low, you're completely unable to spend these sums of money to get the additional health benefit. So you can see why there's a, 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 a crude relationship, but why on earth one times or three times GDP per capita is, is, is a satisfactory um, guide is beyond me. And so I'm delighted we're moving away from it now. The final approach I would say is our primary candidate. And this is the cost per unit of benefit of the services that would be displaced. So rather than some sort of external guide to cost effectiveness, such as three times GDP per capita, what's being asked here is this. If we introduce new, new treatment strategy, a new intervention, what are we going to displace? Now, because all health systems are budget constrained, if we introduce something new, 
We have to display something. The money has to come from somewhere. Now, obviously, um, governments can decide to increase taxation or governments can decide to spend less on roads and defence and education and more on health. And from time to time, they do make that decision. But at any point in time, if we're considering some new treatment or some new public health programme or whatever, we are making that decision with respect to a fixed budget. And if we are going to do new things, we have to give up some other things. And so the suggestion here is that we should look at the cost per unit of benefit that we are among the activities we're giving up. The principle being this, that we don't want to give up activities that have a lower cost per unit of benefit than the new activity. Because if we adopt the new activity, and to pay for it, we give up something that had a lower cost per unit of benefit, we're making ourselves worse off. Our fixed budget is going to produce less benefit.